It's going to start right away. Hi, welcome to the banqueting table. My name is Diana Green, and I'm glad that you decided to join me today. As you know, before we do anything else, let's pledge our allegiance to the Lord. So hand on your heart, your belly, or in the air, and let's say these words together. I pledge allegiance to the Lord with a united, undivided heart, and to the gospel on which I stand, one member of his body, with liberty in the spirit for all. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, and your loving kindness. Lead and guide us each and every day according to your will and your purposes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so the honey of humility. We are talking about the word humility all this year. That is my word for the year. Did you find your word for the year? Mine is humility, and that's what I'm going to be teaching on for the year 2024. Why? Because I need it. <laughs> Why? Because we need it. Why? Because God honors humility. So here we go. The honey of humility, part two. So take a moment, pause the video, grab your Bible, get a notepad, a pen, or a pencil, something to write with, or record, <laughs> a voice record if you want to. And um, let's get started on the second part of the teaching of humility, on humility, here at the banqueting table. All right, so the honey of humility, part two. Now, what I want to start with today is some definitions, and then we're going to look at some various scripture um, translations of the same set of scriptures. And then we're going to look at a couple of examples of a particular word, and I'll tell you about that in just a moment. And then we're going to uh, talk about King David, and then we're going to do a call to action, or in other words, how can you apply this teaching to your life? Okay, so you ready? Say amen. Amen. All right, now, for definitions, I went through to the Hebrew, I went to the Greek, I went to Webster's, of course. I love Webster's Dictionary. I went to the Vines Expository, and we're going to look at some words that incorporate this concept of humility, okay? All right, humility in the Hebrew. <laughs> It is pronounced anava, anava, and it comes from A-N-U, meaning to respond. Keep that in mind as you listen to the Hebrew definition. It means to respond. This word is not a self-degrading word, as sometimes we think humility is. But rather, anava is an acknowledgement that actively responds to the world with the gifts and the abilities that God has given. That's part of humility. I didn't know that, but I know it now. And that's just a beautiful uh, part of that definition to me. An acknowledgement that actively responds to the world with the gifts and the abilities that God has given. Other concordance definitions from the Hebrew language mean, humility means help. It means meekness, it means gentleness, modesty, and condescension. In other words, bringing yourself lower, condescension. So it seems to me then that humility is a two-sided coin. That one side is gratefulness for gifts and talents and abilities, and so much so grateful that one uses their gifts, their talents and abilities to bless other people in the world. And then the other side of that coin means to refrain yourself from self-exalting thoughts, words, and deeds. To refrain from self-exalting thoughts, words, and deeds. I really am enjoying this particular definition of the word humility because it gives the balance. And you know, the scriptures say that God loves a just weight and a just balance. 
Turn over to Romans chapter 12. Let's take a look at this a little deeper before we go into the other definitions. Romans chapter 12. We look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. Romans chapter 12 and verse 3 says this. For I say, and this is Paul talking to the church at Rome. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself or herself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So in some translations, you'll see those words saying, have a right assessment of yourself. And that's what this Hebrew definition and the picture is, a right assessment of oneself. Yes, we have um, challenges and issues and character defects. <laughs> I'm speaking from NA. But we also have gifts, talents, and abilities that God has given to each and every one of us. And being willing to share those is also a part of humility. Isn't that great? So dust off your gifts, talents, and abilities and share them with people around you and watch how you can be a blessing to other people. Amen. The Greek definition, let's move to the Greek. The, the Greek definition, I'm going to try to pronounce this, tapionotita, tapionotita, okay? Tapionotita means humility, loneliness, somebody who is an abaser, and lowliness of mind. We'll get to the mind in just a moment concerning humility. Tapionotita, humility, loneliness, lowliness, lowliness, abaser, and lowliness of mind. The Webster um, defines humility as freedom from pride or arrogance the quality or state of being humble. And then Vine's Expository Dictionary, Tapianos. And Tapianos means to be under the mind. In other words, to put your mind under. And this is going to take us to another set of scriptures that will help to explain that. To put your mind under. Lowliness in mind. Low lying. The position uh, the opposite then of low lying or to have your mind under would be high minded. So with that in mind, I want you to turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 4. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let me see 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 through 4. Actually, let me see here. Yes, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. So let's read this. Again, this is Paul talking to Timothy, his protege. Timothy is a pastor um, of a huge uh, congregation of people. And Paul was Timothy's mentor. And he's kind of warning, warning him about the coming days, the last days. And, he's, and this is how he's describing people will be in the last days. Keep that word low lying and keeping the mind under. Keep that in mind as we read 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. And he's, Paul is saying to Timothy, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, and haughty lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. All those things that he's talking about, behaviors that start in the mind. I mean, lovers of themselves, that begins in the mind, right? So with that, with the vine's de definition in mind, <laughs> under tapianos, under and friend, tapianos and friend is the word, friend, P-H-R-E-N, is tapionofro. It's in the Greek and the vines, okay? 
I hope I'm not confusing you. But anyway, it the concept is keeping our mind under, keeping your mind under, keeping my mind under, okay, having a lowliness of mind rather than a haughtiness of mind, being high-minded. And in in that scripture, that's what Paul is talking about um, to Timothy. He's saying that um, in the King James, it says heady and high-minded in uh, 2 Timothy 3 verses 1 to 4. When he's talking about haughty in the New King James, but in the King James, Paul uses these words, heady and high-minded. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what it means to be heady and what it means to be high-minded. So when we are heady, we are described as being hasty, reckless, and headstrong. And that's the word that he used, headstrong. In the, in the New King James, that's the word that Paul used, headstrong, but it means heady. Um, the other word for it, I should say, is heady. It means that we are hasty, reckless, and headstrong. And isn't that the way when you and I are not walking in pride? That we make hasty decisions, we are reckless sometimes, we are headstrong sometimes, we just push right ahead with what it is we want to do, rather than taking the low-minded road and really stopping and thinking what would god have me do in this situation okay so that's what we're doing when we're heady we're being hasty reckless and headstrong and that's the definition that is the des description of human beings in the earth in the last days and would you agree that these uh, words that describe men and women mankind in the last days is exactly what we're experiencing lovers of themselves lovers of money boasters proud blasphemers speaking ill of god disobedient to parents unholy unthankful unloving unforgiving slanderers no self-control brutal despisers of good calling what is good evil and what is evil good having uh, uh being traitors in other words not keeping promises not keeping covenants headstrong haughty boastful prideful lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of god that is exactly describes the world that we live in today now we know not everybody doesn't act that way but people who are in leadership people who make decisions for the rest of the world People who are influencers and have influential positions in the world, they act that way. Many of them do. And so then we act that way. The other word I wanted to look at besides heady was high-minded. High-minded are individuals who believe themselves as intellectually superior to the so-called intellectually inferior. In other words, High-minded individuals are intellectual snobs. So obviously the direct opposite of being heady and high-minded is humility. And we just talked about those definitions just a moment ago. What I'd like you to do is take a, a, a moment sometime today, tomorrow, whenever you're watching this, and I'd like you to just take a few moments to sit back and ask yourself this question. Which one of these words best describes you today? Heady, high-minded, or humble? Which of those words best describes you today? Heady, are you hasty, reckless, and headstrong? High-minded, do you consider yourself intellectually superior to others? Are you an intellectual snob? Or are you humble? Do you have a low-minded way of thinking and living? I didn't say dumb. I didn't say stupid. I said low-minded. Amen. Keeping your mind low. Amen. So, I must admit, if I take a few minutes and think about the past week or even two weeks, have I been heady, headstrong, or humble? I would have to say 
I've had some struggles being humble. I've had some opportunities and I've taken them to be heady and high-minded. But praise the Lord. We are all in the sanctifying process. And that's why we're doing this study this year is to help us learn what it means to be humble and learn how to live a more humble life. Amen. <clears throat> so as important as those definitions are, the more important thing is what do the Holy Scriptures have to say about humility? And so we're going to enter into a, a passage of scriptures. I'm going to read a number of variations of that passage. And then we're going to talk about it a little bit more, okay? Humility, um, though others benefit from this character, as do you and I, humility at its core is about yours and my relationship with God. It really is about our relationship with God, our Father and Creator. Humility is necessary for believers in God and followers of Christ, and humility is absolutely essential to Christian leaders. In this passage we're going to look at, Paul was focusing on Christian leaders. So I want you to turn, and, and you might say, I'm not a Christian leader. I, I, I'm not a, a pastor. I'm not a, uh, an elder in the church. I'm not, you know, I'm not this or I'm not that. Whatever you might say that you are not, you are leading someone. You are influencing someone. We can agree on that, right? So turn in your Bibles over to... First Peter chapter five. First Peter chapter five. We are taking care of the flock of God in some way. So turn over to first Peter chapter five. We're going to take a look at this scripture that Paul was uh, focusing on leaders with, but we are going to apply it to our own lives because we all in some way, shape, form or fashion are leaders of somebody. Amen. And so 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6 says this. Um, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Now, I said I had a number of uh, variations and translations, so I'm just going to read those now. The Amplified Amplified Classic, excuse me, my braces are just testing me a little bit. The Amplified Classic says, therefore, humble yourselves, demote, lower yourselves in your own estimation. That's what um, Paul was talking about in, in 2 Timothy. The opposite of being heady, high-minded, headstrong. He was saying, and in Romans, have a right assessment of yourself. Balance out the good with the character defects, because we all have them. But we all have good things that um, God has put on it, put in us, talents, gifts, and abilities, and and that and creativity and that sort of thing. So we have to balance out our assessment of ourselves. Um, therefore, humble yourselves, demote, lower yourselves in your own estimation under the mighty hand of God that in due time he may exalt you. Although God has given us some gifts and talents and abilities, we're still not greater than he is. We still need to humble ourselves under his lordship. Amen. Our Father. The Christian Standard Bible says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time. The Contemporary English Version said, Be humble in the presence of God's mighty power. And he will honor you when the time comes. The Easy English Bible, no reason for people not to read the Bible, the Easy English Bible says, remember that God is strong and powerful. So be humble in front of him. Then he will lift you up to a good place at the right time. I like that. Be humble in front of him. We are always in front of him. It doesn't matter what you're doing, even right this minute, you are in front of God. The Good News Translation says, Humble yourselves then under God's mighty hand so that he will lift you up in his own good time. The Living Bible says, If you will humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God in his good time, he will lift you up. There's a theme here. 
The Wycliffe Bible, which is the earliest known literal translations of the entire Bible into English, Middle English, says, Therefore be ye meeked, quiet, gentle, easily imposed upon, under the mighty hand of God, that he raise you up in the time of visitation, that he raise you up in the day of visitation. And that word visitation caught my attention. So I wanted to just take a little deeper look at that. Um, I realize that the day of visitation can be a very deep subject, as can most things in the Bible. But simply put, a visitation is um, a visitation from one person or being to another. And I want you to, this your homework, okay? Say yes, Diana, this is my homework. <laughs> okay, so for two contrasting examples of a visitation, I want you to look at Daniel chapter 5. And I want you to look at Luke chapter 1. Read those chapters, Daniel chapter 5 and Luke chapter 1, to see the contrast of visitation. Now coming back to 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6, I listed some thoughts that might help you to meditate on the verse. And I'm sure that you will formulate your own thoughts. I'm sure the Holy Spirit will speak to you his thoughts. Amen. And in the end, the whole point is that you will experience a shift in being able to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. So the first thought that I pulled from this set of scriptures is we must humble ourselves. Humility is an act of our own will. It's not an act of someone else's will upon us. It is an act of our will, my will and your will. Where do we humble ourselves? Under the mighty hand of God. We have a proper place. It is under God's hand, his leadership, his power, his sovereignty, his gentleness, his kindness, his leading, and his guidance. Amen. So we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Um, Isaiah chapter 64 talks about God being the potter and we are the clay. It says, but now, uh, Isaiah 64 verse 8 says, but now, O Lord, thou art our father. We are the clay and thou our potter. And we all are the work of thy hand right? We are the work of his hand. He is in the process of molding me into a more humble human being. He is in the process of molding you into whatever word you chose for 2024. Amen. He's in the process of molding us into that. He shapes those who belong to him into the vessel that he desires for the purposes he has already planned right? The purposes he has already planned. Ephesians 2.10. So let's place ourselves under his capable hands. The third thought was we will have times of waiting. We will have to wait. It's one of the hardest things to do in life, but the more humble we are, the easier it is to wait. I had an experience at the at the bank not too long ago, the drive through window. I was just going through with a $20 bill to get two rolls of quarters because where I live, we have to pay for the laundry, right? So I waited um, at least, it was probably 10 minutes waiting in the drive through There was a car in front of me. There was a car in front of that car. The car in front of that car took the most time, right? And then the next car, of course, went forward when that uh, transaction finished, I went forward and I sat and I sat and, and I did it without honking my horn. Come on, hurry up. What are you doing? I did it without honking my horn. Praise the Lord. So I pulled up and I sat there and I sat there and I sat there and I was so tempted to honk my horn to let them know I was there, but I sat there and I sat there. The lady came to the window. The teller came to the window. She opened it up. She goes, you've already been helped, right? And I said, no, I said, uh, and then I handed, uh, put the $20 and I said, I just need two rolls of quarters. She said, you sat here all that time 
patiently waiting for two rolls of quarters. That was my victory. I said, I did it. I did it. <laughs> Amen. So we will have times of waiting, even though it's one of the hardest things to do. Why? Because waiting creates anxiety. Waiting can push us to be heady, hasty, headstrong. Head, uh, uh, waiting can push us to responding too quickly. Uh, it, have you ever been on the phone waiting on the phone and about five minutes goes by, maybe 10 minutes go by, maybe 12 minutes go by and you're like, I'm just hanging up the phone. Click. You did not realize that you were the next caller. You were the next one in line, but you were hasty and heady and headstrong. And you hung up the phone because you didn't want to wait. And it cost you, right? It cost you. Here's what Andrew Murray said about um, waiting. God has a plan for his church upon earth. But alas, we often too, we too often make our plan. And we think that we know what ought to be done. We ask God first to bless our feeble efforts instead of absolutely refusing to go unless God goes before us. That is the essence of waiting, waiting on God and moving when he moves. Amen. Number four, we will be lifted at the right time. If you read Psalms chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, the Psalm of David, when he was fleeing from his son Absalom, you'll notice that he said, Lord, how many are my foes? How many rise up against me? Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory and the one who lifts my head up high. Some translations say the one who restores my, I mean, the, the uh, Hebrew uh, study Bible says that that word, the one who lifts my head up, the picture is the one who restores my anointing, the one who restores my anointing. Amen. David demonstrated a lot of humility. If you study the life of David, he was continually threatened by foe and family. <laughs> But he refused to retaliate against them. Instead, he knew that at the right time, God would do him, as my sister would say, a solid. <clears throat> that God would exalt him at the right time. That God would restore him to the rightful place. That God would um, lift him up at the right time. That he would restore the anointing that was on his life when he was called to be king. You know, I admire David's self-control because one of the most difficult things about humility for me is not retaliating when I'm experiencing, get this, a perceived or a real wrong that has been done to me. But I had the opportunity to walk this out not too long ago concerning a co-worker. I wanted to stick it to him. I uh, Believe me, I wanted to stick it to him. But I love the word of the, of, of the Lord. I love the Holy Spirit living in me who wouldn't let me do it. And I'm glad I made the right decision because the option uh, otherwise would have been to give in to my flesh, to give in to my headiness, to give in to my high mindedness. Amen. <laughs> and that opportunity would not have turned out as well as it did because I kept my mouth shut. Praise God. I kept my mouth close. Trusting him like David did. Trusting him to make everything right. Amen. So that's what we have for humility today. I do have one call to action for you. After spending some time contemplating your, your usual responses to life circumstances and challenges and opportunities, I want you to decide whether your current level of humility is hindering or enhancing your Christian life. Is your current level of humility enhancing or hindering your current Christian life? 
With that, I'm going to leave you until the next time we come together. Hopefully it will just be in two weeks when we talk again about the honey of humility. Thank you for joining me at the banqueting table. My name is Diana Green, and I'm so glad that we spent some time together today. Until we meet again, may God richly bless you and keep you. Bye-bye.